as a psychologist, um, a, lot, a lot of what people do is, is um, want to come in and talk and to share. Now, words are extremely powerful, and, and really a lot can happen from being well heard or being able to communicate. But words can only go so deep. And why the float experience is so powerful is we go below the cortex, we really go to these deeper subcortical areas of experience. Now, in the old days, it was thought that the brain was a black box. Now we go into the black box. Really, I I'm going to share kind of a brain-based approach, not, not because it's the only way to look at our, our existence and our consciousness, but it's a powerfully useful one. In that, even back the ancients, Hippocrates talked about how really the brain was an organ of so much of our experience. Um, and I love Emily Dickinson's uh, poem, The Brain is Wider Than the Sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain, um, with ease in you beside. And now, um, as uh, Dr. Feinstein's describing, we have access to fMRIs and technology that we can start to go into that black box and start to understand what's going on in the brain in ways we've never had before. And with this, we're having an emergence of new technologies with a deeper understanding of our nervous system and of our physiology, where with the onslaught of sensory overwhelm, with all the amazing things our material world and sensory world can bring us, um, we're realizing that it can often be stressful when we get exposed with too many sensory experiences. And, and thus, the, the interest, and I think the growing interest, into going into the void, into experiences that are not so sensory dependent. There's also an emergence of a variety of different therapies, um, from you know, tapping techniques to eye position, brain spotting techniques, to the use of color, to the use of sound, to the use of eye, different patterns of eye movements, um, that are really largely sensory based. And for people who are working uh, to eliminate suffering, um, these, these sensory-based modalities really supercharge the psychological and deep work that we can do. And it comes down to, I, I think, one of the fundamental areas is any change of sensory inputs modifies this thalamic function. For those who heard my talk last um, year, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the thalamus because it is the center of the brain. Literally, the thalamus is the center of our brain, uh, kind of the inner uh, organizer, orchestrators, that takes in all of our sensory data, whether it's what we hear, what we see, what we're tactilely feeling, or even our position in space. Um, all of the senses, with the exception of smell, at least our physical senses, go through the thalamus and then are reintegrated and sent out to other parts of our brain. And researchers are talking about how, as in the past, the sensory, the thalamus was only thought of as a sensory gating mechanism or a sensory um, directing mechanism, that, that it actually plays such a central function. And the reason I'm, I'm even bringing this up is it just tells you that senses, light, sound, your position, your, your sense of being in space, your position in space, go directly into the very center of your brain. If you want to get in somebody's brain, going through the senses or blocking the senses and allowing the person to experience more directly their experience in themselves is one of the most profound ways that we can change a, a, a brain experience. This, this simply shows that Within the thalamus, on the right there, um, there's a map, there's a correlation between thalamic nuclei and literally all the areas in the cerebral cortex. And so um, the thalamus itself is a map of the brain within the brain. So again, the sensory input that comes in can really shift accessing all the range of the different areas of the cortex, cerebral cortex. And so we have a place where there's an integration of how we think, how we feel, how we sense, how we experience that inner perception, that interceptive perception um, of, of our heart rate and different bodily functions and muscles, as well as how we relate to our external world, all is, is very much connected to our thalamus. 
Um, and, and one of the wild things is, is that actually 10, 10 times more information from our cerebral cortex will come down from that outer thinking cap in our cerebral cortex and go to the thalamus versus the other way around. So the thalamus is this great collector of, our, all, of all that higher cognitive functioning. And I don't know if I showed this last year, but I was, I was pleased to find in a recent neuroanatomy uh, textbook for behavioral disorders, and th these are uh, professors at, at uh, Dartmouth Medical College. Uh, they reviewed all these references over the last eight years, you know, looking at 40 journals to find even the primary source material, anything they thought relevant to brain function related to behavioral and psychiatric disorders. Um, and they wrote a book to help people in the mental health profession understand it. Of all the things these guys know, they only mention one area of the brain. The thalamus is the only area of the brain that they devote a chapter to because they feel it relates so critically to, to people's experience of wellness or being out of balance. And, and why the thalamus is so cool for us floaters is that's the, sense, that's the sensory connection, that's the sensory gateway, that's what allows the experience of whether we're tuning into kind of the outer world or tuning into ourselves, that when we shift the amount of sensory input going in, we start to change these thalamic rhythms that help to regulate our brain. Um, if you want to really go <laughs> deeply into thalamic cortical rhythms, uh, this is a, a neuroscientist who wrote this book who really um, does a really good job of it. Um, he talks about thalamic cortical dysrhythmias, where if people are dealing with anxiety disorders or people are dealing with uh, pa certain types of pain or depression or um, you know, uh, other types of uh, challenges, that oftentimes there's these thalamic cortical dysrhythmias, these waves that tend to typically organize the brain in, in a balanced person, but in somebody who is out of balance, these rhythms are kind of out of balance. And, and so um, I really do believe, and one of the areas of research I would love to see, is if we could actually measure thalamic cortical rhythms, which is possible, um, and see if after the float experience, people literally have a more balanced brainwave state. Not just during the dive, not we know that brainwaves slow down when a person's in a sensory-free environment. We know you go more into alpha and theta, the slower creative brainwaves, the relaxation brainwaves. But when you come back out, that beautiful experience that most people ex really cherish when they get out of a float is they see the world with new eyes. Things seem more colorful, things seem clearer, there's a settling effect, there's almost like the lens has been cleaned and you're back into the world and you're experiencing it a little brighter, a little more directly. I think that's the tune-up of the thalamic cortical rhythms as well as other things, but that might be one area of research worth looking at. Now, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is related to pain perception. Now, for, for anybody who's suffered with chronic pain or acute pain, you know that when you're in the midst of very strong pain, very little matters. Your, your world can narrow down to such a strong degree that the pain can take over. And, and, um, and there's a range. I really think in the same way that there's so many flavors of pleasure, so many different experiences of pleasure in the world, there's an equal diverse amount of pain in the world, meaning you can experience pains in so many different ways. And so there's not a singular pain when we talk about pain. Pain is colored, tinted by our emotions, by our experiences, by our previous um, histories, uh, by the people close to us or the people who aren't close to us that we want there. In so many ways, um, our experience of pain can be shifted. And, and so one of the interesting things is this was, uh, uh, you can see the author Linus, who's that neuropsychologist who talks about thalamic cortical uh, dysrhythmias. They actually identified certain thalamic cortical dysrhythmias related to uh, certain types of complex pain. And other scientists are starting to detect brainwave patterns related to pain when a person's actually, you know, to be able to tell just by how the brain's operating when it's a person's in pain or not. 
Um, and again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sharing here, the reason I'm sharing this information is I think that it, it is nice to have some uh, model, perhaps, or some way to, to, to think about why would going into a sensory reduced or, you know, sensory completely um, minimal environment, why would that affect pain? But that's, a, that's a, not an uncommon experience. How many of you have gone into a float and, and have either initially noticed pain that you did not even know was there when you first got in, and it could have been subtle pain you were holding, um, and then during the duration of the, pain, the float, that pain was able to dissipate or, or be eliminated in some way. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really common experience. We're, we're really um, seeing a range of different uh, experiences happening within a floating session. In the Perrys had talked about uh, the name Samadhi begin, being given to their tank center, um, their tank business, um, by John Lilly years ago. Well, out of Patanjali's Eightfold Yoga, um, you can see Samadhi is, is a, a deeper state of absorption into the object uh, of meditation, so one merges with the contemplative um, focus. Um, but earlier down the road, we see Pratyahara, and what most people think of as yoga is asana, the asanas, which are the yoga positions, you know, that people get into. Um, but uh, Pratyahara is considered the next step in developing a, a, a deeper self-realization, uh, and that's going in looking at how senses, how, how do we move our experience of being so sensory connected so that we can go into a deeper contact of ourselves. Um, this is what motivated me to, to build my first uh, flotation tank. Um, I was a student of yoga at the time, and I thought, well, geez, you know, rather than spending, you know, 20 years doing all of this other stuff, what if we can start to reduce, um, you know, the sensory input to be able to experience these deeper meditative states a lot quicker. And so now we do have the technology, the consciousness technology, in of various forms and in various ways um, to achieve that. Mahatma Gandhi had said, not to have control over the senses is like sailing in a rudderless ship, bound to break to pieces on coming in contact with the very first rock. Um, and, and when we are in, in difficult psychological states, it's oftentimes our sensory experience that gets blown out of proportion. We get, we, 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 we lose focus or we get, um, uh, we, we, you know, we start to experience things sensory in a different way as well as what's going on inside us. And so again, being able to go into a, a sensory isolation environment allows us to go back in and, and really reset um, uh, our relationship first within ourselves and, and, and before going out back into the sensory experience. And really the primary three senses um, that, mo that dominate most of our brain functions are visual sense or auditory sense and our vestibular sense. Of course, the visual is cut out because of the darkness. The auditory, we do our best to minimize the sound. And the vestibular is, is oftentimes a sense of body position. And, and one of the beauties of floating is there, you really your sense in space can be really altered um, and, and really minimized um, so all three of the areas can be dramatically reduced. I'm going to put a plug in for my book. <laughs> I, I, I just got published in February. Um, it was a five-year project. And, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with floating, but it does have to deal with the ocean, evolution, and a relationship with light molecules, especially in Earth's earliest form, uh, microalgae, which is the most prolific species of organisms on Earth. Now, oftentimes, people are experiencing over or under sensory stimulation. So an under stimulation could be an example of someone who's just kind of spacing out and really um, uh, in kind of, you know, in their own world. Uh, Overstimulation can be somebody who is so acutely connected and overly sensitive in their hearing or in their touch or even in colors. And, and, uh, and so what we're really looking at is how to develop an optimal stimulation band. This optimal stimulation band is our relationship to our outer environment, is our relationship to our world. And, and if we 
um, if we don't have this optimal relationship to our sensory world, we either tend to retreat from it um, uh, or we tend to do things to the extreme to try to you know, experience more stimulation. And so for each individual, there could be an optimal stimulation band. And again, I think this is an area where, where sensory, looking at how to um, give people sensory um, shifting experiences can be very powerful. Now, the, when we go into the deeper brain, we look at the brain stem and the thalamus and then radiating out to the cerebral cortex. Um, you can see pain is, is part of the thing that comes in from, from our... Um, from our peripheral going through our spinal cord up into our brain, and literally the level of arousal can affect, not, can affect the intensity of the experience of pain, but uh, the brain also has the capacity to shift to different areas within the brain. Now, one of the technologies that have been used with um, pain reduction has been biofeedback as well as stress reduction. And some of the early research at St. Elizabeth's Hospital where, where I had um, been involved at one point, um, found that 80% of patients rated rest, in this term rest would be the equivalent of floating, because we had a floating uh, chamber, um, as more effective, um, and only 20% rated biofeedback as more effective, meaning they found they could get the benefits so much quicker, so much more directly um, than, than using, some other, using a biofeedback method. And if you look at um, the role of the thalamus with pain, um, you find that in chronic pain research, the thalamus has been identified as one of the main areas where pain is really registered. It's interesting that pain and sensory experience um, are so connected, but it's really not so surprising. The first experience of touching a hot stove <laughs> is connected to pain for, for most healthy systems. And so it's not surprising that, that in order to protect us, as pain can oftentimes do or sometimes do, which is its primary initial goal, it's going to be connected to the sensory experiences um, so that we don't damage ourselves. And so the thalamus has two main primary areas for pain. Um, there is specific um, areas that are identified. So if you pinch your finger, you're, it, it actually signaling the, the map of your body, the finger map within your uh, cerebral cortex area, sensory motor cortex area, is actually being directed through the thalamus to that area. But then if, if you've had a really bad day and you've you know, been just eating you know, way too much uh, caffeinated stuff or just you know, not getting uh, much exercise or whatever and your system's all gnarled up, um, and you start to have a headache, that headache's going to go through the moon because um, your, your, your arousal level is so high. And so if your arousal level is so high, your experience of pain is going to be so high. Um, and so the pain can be, the thalamus controls both of those areas, create, directing the specific area as well as the general arousal area. And in research um, that's been done, uh, related to chronic pain, they actually were able to identify different pathways relating to cognitive and emotional control of pain um, quite well, it, and, and they tended to involve the thalamus um, as well. So our emotions have such a big uh, effect on our experience of pain. Th this is the technical stuff. Uh, we're almost through this. Um, and so one way that the emotions can affect us is it's considered there's two pathways through the thalamus. One of the pathways, we'll say the low road, is when we see something, our thalamus can go directly to the amygdala or directly to the emotional centers and say, get out of here or just react so quickly. The other pathway is through our sensory evaluators. And so it can go through the cerebral cortex and start to say, well, that is kind of an interesting looking snake. It's at a certain distance away and it doesn't look like it's a poisonous stink. So let's see, you know, let's spend a little more time starting to look at it. And that's where the cognitive appraisal factor comes in. Um, and so we have these two, in these two pathways through the thalamus that can go emotionally either to a direct reaction, kind of a survival place, 
or it can actually go into more of a contemplative place. Um, and these are all linked to our sensory inputs. And so what I like to think of is when we go into a flotation environment and we take out that in initial sensory input, if we have old patterns that will react of hot, those hot, hot um, um, triggers within our psyche, so to speak, those, those, hot, those irritable, hot, quick, emotionally reactive places, everybody I think knows what I'm talking about, um, that when you're in a sensory environment, or sensory-free environment, you're, you may experience that initially, it may come up, but then you have the opportunity to be able to not react immediately to because you really can't react. So then the brain goes, well, there's no immediate danger, so let's kind of process this. And your brain is actually able to process it at a different level um, and ultimately hopefully change those reactive triggers so they're not so linked to the sensory, the way the person looked at me or the way the person sounded or, you know, uh, this person, you know, has this characteristic or whatever it is. We have a lot of sensory-based triggers. And so this is one way that we can start to eliminate those quick, hot sensory-based triggers as well. Now, one of the <laughs> sensory-based triggers um, is, is related to our experience of pain. When I was in India, uh, this is a particular Sufi sect that actually demonstrates their ability to, to overcome pain by um, poking things through their body. And, um, and I know in India, I, I saw ceremonies where people would take these like shish kebabs and put them through their pectoral muscles, put it through their tongue, put it through, you know, pull out their, their part of their neck. All the, you see them, they were like little porcupines. Um, but um, they reported they didn't experience any pain or minimal pain. And oftentimes there was, in this case, there's a lot of bleeding, but oftentimes there, there's not as much bleeding as expected. And the wounds tended to heal very quickly. And part of this is, the way that they're doing this because of particular religious reasons or faith reasons. And the people who've studied this kind of phenomena find that if a person feels safe, either because of their connection with God or their guru or their teacher or whatever it is or their own powers, um, they don't feel pain. So these people are not registering pain, and if you actually measured their brain waves, we wouldn't likely see the type of pain signals that would be seen in somebody who was just inflicted and wasn't, you know, emotionally prepared for this kind of experience. You know, some other images, the, the Sundance of the Native Americans um, and, and some, uh, I think, Malaysian uh, ceremonies. But again, these are people who are in a state of mind where what would be normally very painful for the average person is no longer a painful experience simply because, I'll, I'll move it, I see it's uh, a little too much for some folks, sorry. Um, so some people aren't even experiencing the thing just from century looking at the experience, you know, is experiencing all sorts of emotion, right? And so that just shows you how much a, sens a sensory experience, not even a real experience, but something just perceived from your senses can have such a profound experience in your body. Um, so one of the things that happens is, is we can look at rest working at a level of, of maps or schemas where these uh, thalamic maps um, can be shifted, whether they're emotional maps or physical maps, um, and uh, support healing at that, that level. Here's an example of where the brain stem, you can see there's a map of the head, arm, body, leg location, mirrored in the thalamus, head, arm, body, leg location, sent out to, to the area of the brain, the cerebral cortex that maps our experience where it becomes conscious. So that's where it becomes a conscious experience of our body. Um, but below, there's these maps that literally, if you can shift the map at that deeper thalamic level, you can actually shift the experience, the conscious experience a person has of pain in their body. There's this research showing this related to subcortical structures, um, that literally the thalamus is very much involved with acupuncture. The benefits of acupuncture um, can be seen as, as subcortical benefits uh, from a neurological standpoint. There's some good uh, research on that. Um, we, I, I showed this last year, but even with some float research out of Europe, they actually showed that when a person is floating, um, they can, 
and, and there, the particular classical acupuncture meridians of the body are being stimulated, that um, people in an isolation environment actually can experience more of what that flow, that pathway is, um, compared to somebody who is being stimulated by acupuncture outside of the tank. Um, and so I think, again, it kind of refers to this deeper thalamic pathway. Our experience of pain is very much an experience of um, the emotional message we assign to it, um, as, as well as the meaning we have of it. Clearly, there's physical aspects of pain, so not all pain is experienced, is not just explained by mental emotional factors, uh, but there's a huge component of how we assign um, an experience of pain. And one of the uh, uh, persons that had inspired me to take a new look at pain uh, was Milton Ward. He wrote a book, The Brilliant Function of Pain, many years ago. And he spoke about pain um, not to be avoided at all costs, not to be something to be you know, suppressed, um, but he felt that if one can actually look, have a new relationship with pain, uh, that you can actually uncover a level of wisdom um, to your experience or use oftentimes the pains in our life as a guidepost to make necessary changes. Um, and, and for most people who haven't been um, struggling with chronic pain for you know, a long, long period of time, but maybe have had more episodic experiences of pain, um, the, um, the experience of being able to um, find a way to communicate with your pain, try to figure out what's, what the message that pain has, can be a very profound um, one. And the most direct way, one of the, one of the most direct ways to do that is to go into a flotation environment where you have little to interfere with your experience, your physical experience. Um, Norman Shealy, who was one of the great pain researchers, um, he described that the ideal place to, to teach people pain management techniques was literally where they had an experience as if they were floating kind of, uh, uh, you know, gently above their body. Um, and, and, and he would, um, you know, and when I read that passage, it just reminded me so much of the flotation experience because um, besides becoming more aware of maybe where we're caught, where we're holding on, what are some of the patterns that are um, emotional hotspots, it can also allow us, if we're willing to listen and to spend time with the distressful aspects of our, uh, of, of our float experience, because not every float experience is a positive experience, and for some people, they go through, an, through a, a process of, of experiencing what doesn't feel right. Um, and if one can actually go through that process, um, then you really are, an able, you are able to go far deeper into looking at what may be the deeper purpose of, of that pain and then also um, gradually shift the maps that might hold the pain, whether the emotional maps or whether they're the thalamic maps. Um, and, and obviously, it's not going to be a pain relief for everybody, but for a lot of people, it allows an avenue to work with pain uh, that most people um, don't readily have. The challenge is, is, what is really figuring out what are going to be the best protocols to really work with, uh, and I'm talking chronic pain patients in the tank. For a lot of people, just the experience of floating enough oftentimes can be a spontaneous um, shift in their experience of pain, but for other people, it really may be um, that they may have to have a, a frequency of sessions, maybe five floats in a week, you know, then followed by four floats the next week, followed by three floats the next week, you know, gradually tailoring off to get the type of intensity to be able to really shift um, the patterns that are so embedded within their nervous system. But that really has, you know, that's really a clinical question um, th that, you know, will really have to be looked at, but for people who just want to have a, a more direct experience of their relationship with their body and of their relationship with pain and their emotions, uh, the flotation environment is an ideal place and a very safe place to begin. Thank you.